What is good? What is up? It's Jordan or Texans Thoughts, and I'm back with another video today. We're going to be breaking down the case for Robert Sala as your favorite team's next NFL head coach. And, you know, he missed out on the cycle last year, but now we're lucky. Texans fans, whether you're a Lions fan, Falcons, whatever, we got the chance to fight for his services. And there's some damn good services at that, I cannot lie. And so in this video, I'll be breaking down the positives that come with Robert Sala, kind of the reasons I have for concern with him, and then I'll do a film breakdown on his scheme. So let's get into it. So the biggest benefit that Sala could bring to your team is his leadership ability. And as a head coach, that's arguably the most valuable quality that you'd want to look for. Your X's and O's, you know, whether you're an offensive or a defensive guy, they aren't the end all be all. Can you command a locker room? Can you set a winning culture? Can you get your players to want to run through that wall for you? That, that is what Robert Sala can bring to a team. And no, I'm not just talking about him bringing the energy on the sidelines, screaming and clapping. Yeah, sure, that's cool and all, but that's not what makes a good head coach. I really don't care about that part of Sala. Just ask Cowboy fans how they feel about Chris Richard, who has the same energy on that sideline that people praised and loved and wanted to hire him for. That's not the leadership I'm talking about. I'm talking about the things you hear from the people that he works with or the players that he coaches. You know, Matt LaFleur, he knows that Salah is destined to be a head coach. He has the personality and the drive for it, among other things. But what really stands out to me is how his players talk about him. And it's not just any players. Richard Sherman, one of the most well-respected defenders of all time, whew, he's got some big time praise for him. Just just take a listen. You gotta give Coach Sala, you gotta give Robert Sala a, 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 a abundance of credit. You have to give him an un, unusual amount of credit. And I don't think he's getting enough credit not only here, but in the league in general, you know, to, to have the injuries that we've had week after week after week, the setbacks week after week, we lose we lose two D linemen in the bye week. We don't know, we have uncertainty. We lose backers throughout the week. We got guys who can't practice. Ken and all barely got to practice on a Friday. You know, it, it's, it's, it's week after week and never makes an excuse. And statistically, we're still a top five defense in almost every category. You know, there are guys out there with, with pro bowlers, all pros, and never lost, never had an injury, never had any, any adversity, and they're not putting out a top five defense. He's not making any excuses. He's making great plans week in and week out, and, he's, and we're making it happen. And, and I think, you know, I, I expect him to be a head coach next year because of what he's able to do. You know, he's able to rally men. You know, he's a leader of men, and that, that goes a long way. And Sherman knows. He's been coached by the great Pete Carroll. He knows what it takes to be a great head coach. For him to praise Salah like that is huge. And whether you're the Texans or the Lions or the Chargers, the Falcons, whatever, you're going into a new era, right? And you're wiping the slate clean. You don't want to think about the previous regimes. And the guy you bring in, he needs to install a winning culture. Because culture, it comes from the top and it trickles down to every level of the organization, to your positional coaches, to your coordinators, to your players, to the janitor, to the water boy, right? And that leads to my next point where coaching an NFL team, you know, it's not just a one man job. As a head coach, you have to know that you can't do it all by yourself. I think the perfect example of that is Bill fucking O'Brien. But if you read up on Sala, you'll hear that he doesn't have an ego. He knows who he is and knows that he needs to supplement himself. And Salah's potential coaching staff around him and the potential GM that could come with him is the best out of any Canada out there on the block. And that is very, very intriguing. Starting with the GM, you know, it was rumored that Ed Dodds, they were gonna go together to work together in Cleveland until Kevin Stefanski got the job. And you know, I've talked about Dodds before, I even wrote an article about him, but he's my number one GM candidate. And a pairing of him and Robert Salah, Whew, that's about as good as you can get. On top of that, Salah's experience around the NFL has created many connections, which opens up possibilities for him to bring a good rest of the staff, and, and particularly on the offensive side, the offensive coordinator. When you're hiring a defensive head coach like that, we get it. Like You want to 
place emphasis on the offensive side of the ball as well, right? It's an offensive league. And we want to build around Deshaun specifically. Trust me, I do too. I, I definitely do too. And if we go the Salah route, we can we can rest easy knowing that, you know, he's not just going to go hire a Freddie Kitchens or, or someone shitty like that. He's just not going to let Deshaun, he's not going to do him dirty like that, right? You can look to the 49ers passing game coordinator, Mike LaFleur, or the Niners run game coordinator, Mike McDaniel. Both are from the great Kyle Shanahan tree and have been learning about his philosophies since their time with the Texans. We've seen how that offense can elevate Jimmy Garoppolo and Nick Mullins and how dominant their run game can be. Hell, the Shanahan Kubiak, that tree, is arguably the most successful offensive tree in the NFL. Look at the Browns, Kevin Stefanski, and Baker Mayfield. Look at the Titans, Arthur Smith, Ryan Tannehill. And of course, look at the Rams, Sean McVay and Jerry Goff. If they can elevate all of those quarterbacks, imagine what they can do with Deshaun freaking Watson. So with Salah, you're really getting the full package in my opinion. We haven't even gone into his defensive prowess, but we will right now. With Salah, you're getting someone who preaches simplicity with his scheme. But that simplicity allows his players to play fast and to play hard. And if you look at Salah's time with the Niners, he inherited the 31st ranked defense in the NFL. It took a few years, but once they actually gave him players to work with, he has them balling. And I'll dive more into that talent issue and, and his scheme really as well, because, well, I don't actually like his scheme that much, but we'll get to that later. Um, but, you know, those results are definitely, definitely eye-opening. And what should really stand out to you, though, is his ability to do more with less. The 49ers have been killed with injuries this year, but as Sherman puts it, he's not making any excuses. The Niners still field an above average defense that plays at a top five level at times. And in my opinion, one of the best metrics to kind of measure how well your defense is coached is missed tackles. And it really shows like, can you teach the fundamentals? Can you teach a team to be disciplined, to execute well? And, and you know, the Niners are first in the league in missed tackles, meaning they do have the fewest. And obviously, you know, that's not going to save a defense. It's not what you can just hang your hat on, but it flows into my next point. And that's where, you know, what really stands out to me about Salah is his ability to coach up linebackers. Throughout his entire tenure, he's coached up some elite linebackers. Cushing and D'Amico Ryans with the Texans, Bobby Wagner and KJ Wright with the Seahawks, Telvin Smith and Miles Jack with the Jaguars, and now Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw with the 49ers. And I think this quote from Fred Warner was really eye-opening. You know, he's not just a great coach. He's a great teacher. He's going to make sure your defense has the fundamentals down. And one of the biggest reasons I'd be all for Salah is that he can work his magic with Zach Cunningham. If you look at all the linebackers he's worked with, they all have talent, don't get me wrong, but they weren't perfect. And same with Zach, we know what he can do. We know he can play at a very high level, but this season has exposed some flaws. Now those flaws are coachable, and I'm very confident in Robert Sala being able to improve Zach's game. And if you want to see a film breakdown on what Zach needs to improve on and how we can fix Zach, comment fix Zach down below. Now, there's a lot to like about Robert Sala, but there's a reason why he's not currently my number one candidate. That would still be Eric Bieniemy for now. You know, things are probably going to change. They're really like a 1A, 1B type of situation. Um, but let's get into some of my reasons for concern I have with Sala. Starting with the fact that, and you know, this will really come with any defensive head coach we choose, whether it's Sala, Eberflus, Brandon Staley, really any defensive coach. But I'm of the opinion that you want to build your team and you want to build your identity around your best player, right? That's no longer JJ Watt. That's obviously Deshaun Watson. And I think it's easier to win games if we enhance what we're already doing pretty well and make Deshaun unstoppable. We always talk about how things are too hard for him. Well, let's make his job easier. Let's make him happy. Let's build our identity around Watson and make sure he resigns after these four years. I said earlier that our defense is what's losing us games. Well, in my opinion, the best way to improve a defense is just by stacking talent. 
there's only so much a good defensive coordinator can do if they don't have the pieces. I mean, look at Salah, his first two years with the 49ers, and, and yeah, they improved, but they were still horrible on defense. The same thing is going to happen with us if Salah comes here, but we have even less capital to pour into our defense like the 49ers did over the years. So while it's tough to optimize talent on defense with just a good defensive coordinator, I think it's easier to optimize that talent with a good offense coordinator, you know, scheme people open and make life easier for Deshaun Watson. Moving on though, and another big concern I have that particularly with Salah, you know, it's, it's basically, I just alluded to it, but his defenses weren't good without elite talent. They had four first rounders on the defensive line the year that they were elite, plus two more in the secondary and Richard Sherman. Even their role player guys were damn good too, even the guys who had lower draft status. Like, and it would be one thing if Salah's scheme, you know, his X's and O's, his adjustments were elevating the talent and really enhanced the players and put them in great positions to succeed. If he did that, I would be a hell of a lot more confident in his ability to improve our team because I do believe that your scheme is, is very important, right? But his scheme is, is very vanilla, man. He relies on player execution. He relies on his stars making plays. And I'll give you film examples of that here in a minute, but that definitely worries me. And one last argument against Salah I got is, you know, people bash on enemy because it's not his system. It's Andy Reid's system. But Salah's defense ain't his either. You know, when he first ran the 49ers defense, he ran the Seattle cover three. That's not his scheme. And he still does that scheme sometimes now, but now they're primarily a 4-3 wide nine quarters heavy scheme. And guess what? That's not his scheme either. It's actually his defensive line coach, John Kukrek, who has installed it. And Salah apparently didn't even have say in that decision-making process either. So how much control does Salah actually have over this defense? We don't know. Now, this isn't a huge knock on Salah, just like for me, it isn't a huge knock on Biennemi. That's why, there's a reason why I listed this one last. But for just argument's sake, like, People are screaming this exact same thing about Eric Bieniemy, but no one hears it about Robert Sala. And so again, it's not a big deal for me, but I just want the energy to be the same. Now for my personal favorite part, let's break down the film of Robert Sala's scheme. And to be completely honest, I'm not a fan of his scheme. Sure, sure, the numbers look good, but numbers lie, man. Numbers lie. They don't show the full picture. And I don't think Sala is doing anything special on defense and he can actually get pretty predictable at times but i'm not just gonna sit here and say that i'll show it to you with the film because the film don't lie so again let's start out with what they do well first and i'm looking purely at the 49ers 2020 film because wherever salad goes he's not gonna have the talent they did on the 2019 team so let's see how he does with less talent. And the number one thing that I think he can improve his shitty defense with is tackling. Like I said before, you know, you'll always see every player on the defense rally to the ball. And they limit Yak, man. That's been a huge detriment to the Texans this year and something Salah can definitely help with. Now, that's not really a scheme thing. It's more of just a teaching thing. But the number one thing I like with his scheme is his third down defense. He likes to blitz in third and longs, and you know, he's not crazy creative, but he coaches his players so well that they execute to a T. 49ers are in a cover one nickel blitz here, and I like that they have their cornerbacks pressing, jamming to slow down the wide receivers and give the blitz time to get there. Let's look at the actual structure of the blitz here, and it's the little details that you can tell Salah he has them work on to perfect the blitz. Number one, this safety, he isn't hinting that he's blitzing whatsoever. It looks like he just cover one man and he's guarding the tight end. That's huge. Number two is how Nick Bosa rushes. Bosa is a superstar and Salah knows that offenses want to double team him. So he tells Bosa to rush inside, not outside like he almost always does. And that draws the tight end and the left tackle inside, opening up a free lane for the safety. It's the little details like that which help you understand why players think he's such a good teacher. I also like how he disguises coverages on third downs with rotating safeties or he'll have you think a blitz is coming then drop off into something else. 
So much of a defense is showing the offense numerous looks so that they don't know what to expect. If you can mess up their post-snap looks from their pre-snap looks, that's a major factor to having a successful defense. Now, these rotating coverages and disguises on third down are great, but it's what makes Salah's first and second down defenses all the more frustrating. He plays it exotic and creative on third, but super super vanilla on first and second. The base of Salah's scheme is a 4-3 stack wide 9. So we've got 4 down linemen, 3 linebackers, and these linebackers are in a stack formation, where they're essentially stacked above the D-line, in between these gaps. The wide 9 part of the formation symbolizes the defensive end, sometimes it's 1, sometimes it's 2, but this defensive end is going to be in a 9-tech position, outside of where the tight end lines up. It's a position that JJ Watt loves to play, and an overall formation that works well when you have an elite speed rushing defensive lineman, but one that also plays disciplined and with power. It actually forces players to play perfect, and when they don't execute, there's not a lot of room for error. Here the 9 tech flies upfield instead of staying in his gap, <laughs> just like JJ Watt. The linebackers are a bit slow to react, and here Quan Alexander takes a poor angle. Two of their star players don't do their job, and that's the problem. There's not room for error with this scheme. It works really well when guys make great plays, but when they don't, good luck. Another example of this is a run stuff by Fred Warner. The Cardinals are going to run power here and create a numbers advantage on the edge. They've got a 5-on-5, five five, which means there's no one to tackle the running back. They all get a hat on a hat, but Fred Warner makes a great play to get off the block and make a tackle. This scheme can work well if guys make big time plays like that, but it's rare your weak side linebacker on this play is going to shed a block as well as Warner does. He's a generational talent in that way. Again, the scheme can work, but it takes great players to make it happen. Players that we or another rebuilding team just doesn't have right away. The other thing I don't like about the 4-3 wide 9 is that it really allows your linebackers to be blocked if they're not super aggressive. Like I was just saying, Warner, he's great at getting off blocks, but even he can't do it all the time. And if you can block a defense's mic, you're going to have success in the run game. So why is the wide nine bad in this sense? Well, look at the massive gap between the defensive linemen. The center is completely uncovered and doesn't have to block anyone, so he can go straight to Warner. He gets washed out the play, and the Rams are able to do that quite a lot throughout the game, fueling their run game. And this leads to my next point where I don't think Salah makes good in-game adjustments. He sort of just relies on his talent to eventually make enough plays. A perfect example of that was versus the Seahawks this year. They had no answer whatsoever for DK Metcalf, and you know, I get that Richard Sherman was injured, but this is a man that prides himself on not making excuses, right? Let's not start now, Salah. So Metcalf, he went off for 12 catches, 161 yards, and 2 touchdowns, primarily because he had one-on-one -on -one coverage versus cornerback Emmanuel Mosley all day. Seahawks offensive coordinator Brian Schottenheimer, he did some good things to get him one-on-one -on -one coverage, but it was all made possible because Salah was hard-headed. He wanted to sit in a single high defense all damn day, instead of a two high defense where they could give Mosley safety help. There's not many cornerbacks that can cover DK Metcalf one-on-one, -on -one, but Salah didn't seem to care. The first time they ran too high when Mosley was matched up with DK came at the end of the third quarter. And even when they did that, Salah got pantsed by Schottenheimer anyways. The 49ers come out in a two high quarters look here, and they're actually blitzing the nickel. Shoddy knows how the Niners defense will react to motion though. He scouted them out, and so he wants to get DK single coverage here, right? So he'll send the motion across the field, knowing that the Niners will rotate from a two high to a single high coverage. Now, bam, no safety help yet again, and that's too easy. Salah only called a too high defense one time the rest of the game. And guess what? It worked! They targeted DK Metcalf and the safety came downhill to make a great play. The formula was there all along, but Salah was too damn hard headed to change his ways. He just hoped and prayed that Mosley would figure out how to cover DK one on one. That's not a good look on Salah whatsoever. And honestly, a huge knock for me on his ability to be this defensive mastermind that people think he is. Number one, he had a bad plan to cover DK. Number two, when said plan failed, he was too hard-headed to try something else for most of the game. And number three, when he finally did try something else, he got out-adjusted. Schottenheimer isn't even some great genius of offense himself. 
How is Salah going to stand up to the McVeighs, the Shanahans, or the Reeds of the world? But in the end, while I have major concerns over Salah's ability as a defensive coordinator, if he's the head coach, there's a very good chance that he'll be delegating a ton, and we might ever have to see these concerns with him running the defense. His leadership qualities cannot be questioned, and he seems like he can change the culture of an organization practically overnight. If the Texans hire Salah as their head coach, I wouldn't be mad. Hell, he's still my number two option, but I wouldn't be screaming for joy either. Every candidate has their warts, and my job is to present all the possible information to you, positive or negative. And so if you enjoyed the video, please do hit that like button, subscribe for more content, and comment down below your thoughts on the video. Take care everyone, come back for more, and remember, the film, don't lie.